Josh Brown, people are not playing new video games. Is everyone still playing Grand Theft Auto V, Scott Tilford? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 11 years later, <laughs> playing a PlayStation 3 game. <laughs> can't get enough of it. Xbox 360 is <laughs> old over new again. Um, this is a report that comes from NewZoo, an analyst firm who did a report based on all platforms and looking at monthly active users for all video games across 2023. And they realized that the average game being played across PlayStation and Xbox was seven years old. 7.2 on Xbox, 7.5 four on PlayStation. The average age of games being played on PC is almost a decade, and Nintendo's average is 3.9 years. Um, mm. It is interesting here that Nintendo were the only platform to have multiple console exclusives propping up the top 10. Uh, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is at number two, Mario Wonders at three, and then you've got Mario Kart, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, Animal Crossing, Smash Brothers, all in the top 10, um, which are only available on Switch. Another notable thing is that Starfield was the only single-player game across Xbox, PlayStation, and PC, um, and to quote pure Xbox's write-up of the report, Players spend over 60% of their time playing games that were six years or older in 2023, which was an increase from 57% in 2022 and 45% in 2021. The last thing is that only 23% of these games were new releases with the charts dominated by Call of Duty, Roblox, Minecraft, GTA 5, and Fortnite, which I feel like people will already have noticed if you ever go on the search bar on the PlayStation, yeah. it's the same games over and over again. There's only so many slots in that top 10. That's it, man. Like I said, I, I was joking about GTA 5 earlier, but you know, you, we, we got the um, results for the most bought game in the UK over the last year, and GTA 5 was mm. still in the top 10. That thing will never exit, and you can reliably count Call of Duty and Assassin's Creed and Mario Kart and FIFA and a bunch of others mm. as franchises that constantly are in that top 10 and very rarely drop out. And if they do, they're straight back in. This, mm -hmm. to me... I don't care what people play, no. but to me it's worrying because this is exactly why I think publishers are pivoting towards live services and fewer games, but like banking on them in a much bigger way because yeah, you can make a game that makes a lot of money, mm. but the absolute golden goose, the ceiling they're trying to hit is a game like a Fortnite, a game like a Roblox that you are playing that is Forever. always in the conversation and <laughs> is being in the top 10 most played games seven years after it released. That to them is exactly what they want yeah. and they will sacrifice everything at the altar of trying to achieve that. The thing is, like, I, it's so brazen. Like, if you bring up the um, the games that are actually in the top 10, like I mentioned, you've got your Robloxes, your Fortnites. GTA 5 has been in there since day one. It was replaced by the next-gen version that came out in 2014 and then obviously the uh, next-gen next version that happened again. GTA 5 has just ticked over uh, and mine Craft. And Rainbow Six Siege has quite a tail on it as well, which is interesting. I was surprised by that because yeah. I, thought, I knew it was huge and had a huge player base, but I, I had wondered if that had dwindled over um, the past couple of years, mm. but seems not. Seems like no, that thing's like, still going strong. My overall thing is that like that whole thing of like, oh, the industry's pivoting into trying to trying to have their own Fortnite. We've seen that everywhere. You see some Suicide Squad, Killer Justice League is their attempt at making a Fortnite. It even has the battle bus style missions in it um, in terms of protecting the thing or having a battle bus um, iconography in there. Um, to me, there are only so many slots in this top 10 and um, because in terms of the amount of money they would want to make from those games yeah um, and you see it from the likes of square enix where they're perpetually unhappy with anything they put out um but still the viability of an average gamer picking up a new game i feel like that's gone down like i have primary research from family members of mine who are regular gamers who aren't picking up regular aren't picking up games on the regular anymore and um, i don't know if you've experienced that as well yeah but i feel like in general people play less games and i wonder whether that's a, a price point thing like games are worth more than ever. Sorry, like it cost more than ever. And then are often more broken than ever as well. Yeah, man. Um, but also like that whole idea of, of the live service future or the live service present, is that more palatable now? Is that just the way the industry is now? Um, and that attempt to sort of try and make single player stuff, people are asking for single player stuff, but then the market only reflects a multiplayer um, you know, uh, overall, when yeah. you reflect multiplayer games, like the fact that Starfield is the only single player game in there, Baldur's Gate 3 didn't permeate. Yes. Like that's that's kind of fascinating. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting what you say about why aren't people buying, um, you know, new games? Is it the price point? Is it something else? Is it <laughs> the state that the games often release in? Like mm -hmm. 
cyberpunk or something like that. And I think I said this on a podcast a few weeks ago, but I always think about myself because I'm a narcissistic <laughs> a-hole. Um, As well you should. But I think about like my own relationship with buying games and it's like, I have a job where mm. we talk about games all the time. So, you know, I've got a big reason to buy them apart from them just being a thing I'm passionate about. Mm. Um, I'm fortunately, touch wood, at this moment in time, financially stable enough to be able to pay the £70 price point for a game I really want. Mm -hmm. And yet something like Dead Space comes out that I absolutely, you know, have this attachment to, was looking forward to, and I go, I don't know if I can afford £70 this time. Yeah. Star Wars Jedi Survivor drops and I'm scouring reviews for the first time in ages because I'm thinking, oh, even though I'll cover it on uh, for work or whatever, um, £70 a lot of money, and if it's going to be a little bit broken, like, am I going to regret that decision? So if, as someone who does this for a living and is in the industry or whatever, mm -hmm. is questioning it to that level, like, surely a more casual player is looking at these games going, ain't no way I'm going to play Fortnite because that is free and all my mates play it <laughs> and it's accessible. It's got cross-platform play. Hell yeah, I'm just going to jump into that. Yeah, I'm kind of like fast. In a wider sense, I'm fascinated by what brings people to buy the video games. Like, I feel like the last big thing we were all talking about, if you go before Helldivers 2, which felt like a big moment this year, of like a lot of people were either curious about Helldivers 2, a lot of people picked up Helldivers 2 and were a lot of people talking about like the heyday of Xbox 360, Xbox Live multiplayer, loved all that stuff. To me, the last time that everyone turned heads was Elden Ring. Um, yeah, and that yeah. was like mid-2022. Like it's been a long time. As packed as 2023 was, I didn't feel like there was a huge thing that every, you had everybody talking about, the water cooler video games. And I don't know whether that echelon of games is dead because I it's that whole wider conversation about monoculture and it was so much easier to track specific releases and we were all, like the um, the actual fan base was smaller, like you had um, console manufacturers and studios not targeting the mainstream as much, et cetera. Yeah. Like I'm fascinated by all those conversations because to me at least the monoculture conversation is at the heart of why everything feels so disparate. Yeah, um, And it's right. like, I like something, do you think about how omnipresent the MCU was? A lot of people, or the vast majority of people either had an opinion on the MCU or they were watching the movies. And since then, in cinema, there's not really been anything like that. Yeah. And uh, that's only in the cinema side. But, like, I do think that there is a, an impact from that. Um, and you're seeing it in the games industry. Like, um, I guess all the, the top tens, the Fortnites, the Robloxes, they are almost their own monocultures, but they're kind of siphoned off. Like, yes. they're, they're not necessarily permeating outside of their own islands. Disparate, I think, is the mm. right word there. Because you can get these things that are so popular, but they... They, oh, they are popular because of the communities they attach yeah. and, and attract, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really spread to the mainstream in a way where everyone is talking about it. Like, you're not going to your friends like, you need to play mm. this. You'll recommend it to the people you know who will like it. Or you might recommend it to your pal who plays games and get them in. And you'll talk about it online on the Reddits and the Discords. And you'll have that community, community there, which is great. But like you said, it's so hard to break through and release a game or release a movie or release a television show that everyone feels like they need to drop everything and watch. Mm -hmm. Like there have been amazing games, there have been amazing movies, there have been amazing television shows over the last few years. But I think the feeling is because the way we receive that content and with there being such a volume of content, it's always a pick and choose situation now where it's like, hell yeah, I'm going to watch House of the Dragon at some point, but I'm not watching it week to week like I was with Game of Thrones. Yeah, that I was another feel, one. I don't feel that need to do it. Same with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, mm -hmm. a game I'm really looking forward to play, but I know I can have that conversation with you at any time mm -hmm. and I can jump on the Reddit at any time and people will still be talking about it. It doesn't feel like it dominated the moment in the same way that the original remake even did four years ago. No, that Thrones is a fascinating one. If you compare the vibes around game, the original run of Game of Thrones, obviously the final season, lol, it was a tire fire, but the general conversation around the rollout of that show versus the general conversation versus to the rollout of House of the Dragon, like that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, and I, I feel like you see that um, in regards to um, the biggest games that people talk about, or the idea of being excited about a game every couple of months. Um, most people, and whether it's a financial reason or the marketing reason, aren't showcasing games enough or something's not big enough and um, aren't buying into a, a steady 
uh, cadence of newer video games. Um, I do think it's interesting. I was looking at, obviously, the, the PS5 side of things. They don't have a single exclusive or first-party game in the top 10, whereas even on the Xbox side, for as much as they get dragged for not having the game, mm. Starfield was in the top 10. Yeah. Um, and Starfield was, was a major reason to invest in Xbox. I get that the player pool is smaller. Yeah. Um, and then if you're still sticking with Xbox, you will pick up Starfield. And it's on Game Pass, so, like, you might yeah. as well. I guess that's, that's it, right? I think there are a few interesting differences between uh, Sony, Nintendo, and Nintendo and Microsoft here. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes down to the audience and the games they're kind of known for because, yeah, I was also shocked that there were no first-party Sony games in there. But I also kind of concede that none of their big first-party releases are on the scale of Starfield in terms of playtime. Like, people are encouraged, I think, to play Starfield for hundreds of hours. That's true. I was thinking, like, Spider-Man 2, but it's not, yeah, yeah it's not even, the same size game. Even yeah. Spider-Man 2, like, you can 100% complete that game, get the Platinum in, what, 40 hours, 35 oh, yeah, hours? Yeah. Like, the, the, they're, they're shorter games, they're still chunky games, but I can see why people will play those games once, have a great time, and then not keep coming back to them like they would a Fortnite or even mm. a, a Starfield. A lot of people hate Starfield, fair enough, <laughs> but the people who like that game are probably still exploring, probably still finding things, probably going through with different builds, mm. kind of like how you play Skyrim or, or a Fallout. It's like got that chunkier RPG mm. mentality. And when you talk about Nintendo, I think that's fascinating because to me, um, I, I wonder, and I threw this question out to you before we started recording, <laughs> how much... Um, their list is dominated by first party games. I wonder how much is that down to the Nintendo Switch not being known as a place for third party titles or at least the best versions of I was those say, the bigger ones, titles. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like obviously mm -hmm. stuff like Minecraft is on there, but I can see why a Call of Duty, because it's literally not <laughs> available on the platform, wouldn't be on there, or even Fortnite, which again is available on Nintendo Switch. Um but Or you GTA. Know, or GTA, but you wouldn't wanna necessarily play that version if you already own a PlayStation mm. or an Xbox, even like a PlayStation 4, you know, you might want to play that ah, version of Fortnite or something. That's a fascinating thing. So yeah, we'll talk about, let's talk about like console exclusive stuff and why you buy a console because in decades gone by, it would have been for the first party stuff or at least the intent on the first party uh, console manufacturer side would be to show off the system under the assumption that it then gets into the top 10 of that year. Um, if something like Spider-Man isn't breaking the top 10, that's a huge blow to the idea of either single player games, um, uh, non-multiplayer games, etc. And uh, I just, I wonder about that. Like the whole yeah. thing about reading the tea leaves of the industry and wondering what they, everyone talks a big game about single player stuff, including us. Um, and I wish there was more of it, but you look at the top tens across the board and they're all the live services, the multiplayers, et cetera. They're, you do get them on Switch, but like you said, um, that's always an, that's an interesting thing. If there were more GTA fives or bigger yeah. third party stuff available on Switch, would that just dominate the top 10? And would you lose the Mario's and Zelda's or are they stronger? Like, <sighs> I think they're stronger because yeah. it's Nintendo. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I think it's it's interesting. I think it's almost a kind of a, a false equivalency, right? Mm. Because I know publishers are going to look at this data and go, we need to make everything Fortnite. We need to make everything Roblox. We need to get people in <laughs> and have them playing every single day for 10 years, seven years, get them in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But I think that does overshadow just how successful single player games have been. Yeah, they might not have been. They might not have made it into these top tens, but... Like, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 sold over 10 million copies. Yeah. Spider-Man 2 was Sony's fastest-selling first-party title. Mm -hmm. um, Jedi Fallen Order surpassed expectations a few years ago. Survivor sold well. You know, we've seen these big... Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 just sold 2.5 million copies yeah, for a, a, a niche, obtuse, open-world RPG mm -hmm. Tie, tied to a franchise that a lot of people didn't know about. The point I'm trying to make is we're seeing all of these successes, but again, it's does that matter to the publishers or are they chasing that golden goose of, yeah, we're I mean, obviously selling 10 million copies is good, but what if we sold 10 million, million copies and <laughs> people were still playing the game seven years later and buying all our microtransactions? What about that, yeah, Josh? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the specific nexus of the whole thing. Like, yeah, like some studios will see 10 million players and be like, oh my God, 10 million players, that's awesome. What are we doing next? Another publisher uh, will look at go 10 million for a single player game and go, oh my God, that could have been 10 million microtransactions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Why yeah, did yeah. we not do that? And then let's plug more content, let's monetize this and keep going. 
time, Tekken A. And uh, yeah, that's because uh, you get people like um, Sven Vinke over the the head of Larian saying that we don't believe in um, microtransactions. I think it was the same thing on the CD Projekt Red side yeah, as well. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Um, for Witcher and, and that kind of stuff. And it's just interesting, like the, that idea of like, what does the market respond to? Like, I mean, something like Helldivers 2 is a massive success. Um, and I'll be interested to see if NewZoo does another report this time next year where the Helldivers 2 was in the top 10. Um, and that's different in terms of monthly active users to overall revenue, but in terms of microtransactions. But um, that whole thing of what is the market responding to, there's always an underlying assumption that the market responds to quality, single player, storytelling, big yeah. things, things that made impact in previous generations. Yeah. Whereas now, because the offset is seven years, you've still got people clinging on to stuff or repeatedly playing stuff that was successful a whole generation or two generations ago. And there's Ludicrous. so many interesting things here, right? And I want to throw a question over to you because we're talking about like publishers looking at this data. But I also think like, and I'm not the first person to say this. In fact, I saw a few people talking about it with in regards to Pal World's play drop off. <laughs> 97% drop. That's it, right? But I don't think for me personally, that discourse isn't really helpful no. in the, the way we talk about games now and we analyze their success, not in terms of sales or even player satisfaction, but in terms of retention. And are you still playing that game? For me, that's very alien. Maybe yes. it's because I'm used to all the games, but like a lot of people, I saw that drop off to Power World and I was like, well, yeah, it's a game that came out months ago. Yeah. People have moved on to something else. Some games are like kind of finite, even if they have, you know, open-ended structures or are survival games. Mm -hmm. You know, people were talking about other single-player games that released last year. I think Spider-Man was one as well. Talking about the player drop-offs. Why is no one still playing this game? Or why are a few <laughs> people still playing this game? And it's mm -hmm. like, because we played it. We played it. We well, finished <laughs> it. And I will play Spider-Man 2 at some point, but... It's not a game that's even designed for me to keep coming back to. So I do think that's a part of the, not necessarily problem, but the, the sort of fixation on yeah. retention and hour length and that sort of side of the industry. I feel like I'm freaking out because I'm just thinking that applies so much to like all IP right now. Yeah, like how do yeah. we how do we bloat this IP and do another five more of these? How do we keep it going? How do we stretch this out um, and over monetize it? And um, that general approach is the thing that has just driven so many of these, uh, the want for this stuff straight into the ground. Um, I just, uh, that whole thing, the thing is like for a healthy industry and I obviously the model of success is gonna be based in maybe nostalgia or a, a bygone generation. It, it depends on the individual. Do they, does the, do you think the current gaming industry is healthy? Does it feel healthy? Does it feel like it's viable yeah. for really good gameplay ideas and creativity? Um, and a lot of that comes down to the idea of can experiences be finite? Like the, the generation we're comparing it to or past generations is that you would play through a set of games a year and they were that year's games. Yeah, yeah. And I do think there is a negative to that because there, there was a whole thing about people don't go back through their games back in the day um, and you'll get so much more hours something replaying it but that's different to monetizing the grind yes. and that's different to bloating things and stretching it out and doing another installment in something just for the sake of stretching out an IP Absolutely. and um, I want more smaller games that you actually finish like it's so rare that you hear where you go, oh that game even now Dragon's Dogma 2 averages like 20-30 hours yeah, that's still 20-30 yeah. hours <laughs> unless like, you're playing for 70 like me <laughs> but yeah it certainly does but still like that idea of like whenever we find out yeah. that there's like a really good sort of 8 to 10 hour game it's like, oh, thank God, yeah. <laughs> I'll actually finish it. Like, great. I mean, it, I mean, I'll try and hit credits on a main thread of anything, but like, if it's something that, um, like I said, is designed to be completely consumed in a weekend and you have yeah. a lovely weekend with something, I don't know, to me, that's a healthier industry, but I get the publisher expectation is if they're always aiming for the Apex Legends and the Fortnites, it's never going to be enough. Yeah, man. No story game ever would be. And I understand even player expectations. If they're expected to pay more mm. money now for these games, $70 for a game, and it only it is, quote unquote, only 15 hours, I get their frustration. That mm -hmm. might be the one game they can afford to buy all year at that price point and you want it to be longer, you know what I mean? You don't want to pay that much money for, mm -hmm. you know, eight hours of copy and paste admission design. <laughs> Suicide Squad again. <laughs> um, so I do get that side of it as well as the publisher side of it, but I also look at the um, sort of lack of new releases in this top 10 list and mm. new franchises and we're looking at stuff like Fortnite which was established seven years ago, Call of Duty which has been around forever mm -hmm. and I wonder how much of it is a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because the games that are maxing out these lists are established franchises mm. but at the same time we've got publishers who are openly saying 
we're not taking a risk on new IP, so that's not even coming through anywhere. So if all they're willing to make is franchises, of course, that's all these lists are going to be made up of anyway. So I wonder if that's kind of like when they were saying, and I always go back to this, no one plays horror games, single player games are dead. And it's like, (laughs) yeah, they're going to be dead if you stop making them. You you can force that narrative in a way. And I I wonder how much is that? is it, it the publisher sort of discourse eating its own tail with yeah. stuff like this, I don't know. Well, the thing is, like, the fact that, Star, I mean, you can argue Starfield's success is because it's Bethesda, that's obviously part of it, but that is a new IP, and that did get to number eight in the overall most played games of the year. It was True. above FIFA 23 and Apex Legends. So, like, and there was that whole conversation around Starfield, about, oh, dude, games don't sell consoles, and the Phil Spencer side of things. It's the service, it's the Game Pass, it's the ecosystem. That's what people are going for, and maybe that's true. I'll always just say games sell consoles, because they literally do. Yeah. Like, um, I if someone bought a PlayStation 3 to play Metal Gear Solid 5, they bought an Xbox to play Starfield. Consoles sales spiked when Starfield came out. How hard is this? <laughs> um, but still, uh, that whole thing of um, is it enough though? That idea of retention. Yeah. Like you get the news headlines saying that the player base has dropped off. In a healthy industry, that headline wouldn't exist. I think that it exists because of clicks. I get that. I get the mm. business reality of that because um, we have the reaction to it and you want to click in and see what's going on. Um, but like I said, in a healthy industry, we wouldn't even care about retention. You would be yeah. expected to finish the game in a weekend, in a week, in a month. That's like, true. That's how, at least to me, it should be. But I know that I'm born in 1989, and I think that way. I think even then, even if the games themselves have an open-ended tale, have a big end game, are always online games, like something I love, like Call of Duty Warzone, mm. I still think it's a strange way to look at it because it's like, it's not just for me. Are people still playing? Because there's a, there are a multitude of reasons as to why they might be. You mm. know, we talked in the Tekken 8 video about how that might just be because you bought a battle pass and you feel obliged to jump on to do your dailies, mm-hmm. to grind that out. You want to get your money's worth. It's like, I think a better metric is, are the people who are still around enjoying themselves? Are they getting <laughs> good content? Are they playing for a reason? Or are they playing because one, that's a game that's easily accessible. Mm. And two, because they've got all of these different different dopamine hooks into them like games yeah. get into my own brain as well that encourage them to keep coming back for more even if the content itself isn't all of that isn't all that satisfying mm-hmm. you well, yeah i mean especially with the younger audience like it's obviously so i mean there was so much um discourse going on as we were growing up about like how addictive video games were and whatever but the, those potential hooks have only got more nefarious and then now they're monetized um but yeah something like fortnite roblox minecraft is going to skew a lot younger than a call of duty um or a gta um and then you have that audience that is pre-built to just ex- to expect well i can get a few years out of this game yeah, in the man. case of minecraft that's 14 years old now i think minecraft and fortnite are really interesting case studies because we look at those games as being as old as they are and I wonder how many how much of their player base have aged out of it not mm-hmm. saying that those games are exclusively for younger people you know I still jump into Fortnite from time to time mm-hmm. got a lot of friends who play Minecraft but you know I imagine a lot of players who jump into those games like Minecraft or Fortnite might be someone's first ever game. Yeah. You know, Fortnite, yeah. especially Fortnite's free. You get a game console, you get a phone, you can play a Fortnite. Mm-hmm. You can, that's, that's again, it's an access thing. All of your friends at school could be playing Fortnite. Mm-hmm. And, but if that's your first game, it's like, why would I buy something else? This has got me almost for life. We're going to have all of these new updates. We're going to have this cross media approach where why would I want to go and buy Spider-Man for $70 when I can play Spider-Man and Fortnite? Yeah. You've got Dragon Ball Z characters in there. You've got John Wick in there. <laughs> Why would I ever want to leave this ecosystem, especially because everyone else is playing it and they keep giving me reasons to log back in. And that's all I've ever known as well because it's been my first ever video game. Yeah. And is this not just the norm? Well, Are I mean, not supposed to keep playing this? I don't I don't think that that'll change. I think the, the people who are in or in those bubbles or in those ecosystems aren't going to be leaving them. Like the, in terms of the player numbers, um, like I'm not suddenly going to get back into Fortnite. Like after mm. that initial bubble blew up, like it retained the people that it retained, the people who are in are loving the fact that they're in. To me, the thing that will have to change, um, depending on whether as an industry, as an art form, we even care about shorter games, story-based games, whatever, stuff that isn't live service. And multiplayer is the publisher expectation. It'll yeah. it'll have to be, this game doesn't need to sell hundreds of millions of copies. They set a, a, des- a designated sales figure and that's okay. Yes. Um, and it's okay that it's not in the top 10. Like, and, But I get what Phil Spencer was talking about, how about he has shareholders to please and he doesn't have the luxury of not thinking that way. Yeah. Like at a certain echelon of production, I get the Western capitalistic side as well. Yeah. Um, not in favor of it. 
<laughs> I just want quality stuff. <laughs> but um, I get the um, the wider machinations of it that keep leading Dude. to this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the takeaway point. If you have watched this long, thank you very Big much. Big fan of you, to the be honest. The point is not we should only have single player games or eight hour games or we should have no live service games. The mm. point is we need an industry where all of these things can exist together and we're not just chasing one model, like you said, mm. where publishers can set expectations and be happy that they sold 20 million copies of a Harry Potter game or 10 million <laughs> copies of Baldur's Gate 3 and not view those sales as missed opportunities for even more money because mm -hmm. you can have your live services, you can have your single player games and surely you're making enough money. Well, the amount of money that's doing the rounds at the minute is only between all the live service multiplayer stuff but the likes of Sven Vinke talking about Baldur's Gate 3 and being happy about it is like one of the only CEOs who's actually happy about the fact they didn't break into the top 10. Dude! Bloody Assassin's Creed Valhalla made a billion dollars. How can you not be happy with that, man? <laughs> Come on.